evening. Uh, my name is Laura Joy. I'm Port Heritage Director at the uh, Dublin Port Company. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our second lecture uh, in the Dublin Port and its links to, to the city. Um, very much looking forward to tonight's lecture, which will be by Eamon O'Reilly, who's Chief Executive uh, of Dublin Port. As you know, this is a, a series of three lectures. Last week, we had a, a fascinating lecture by Ron Cox uh, on Bindon Bloodstoney, the, the famous uh, Dublin Port engineer. Uh, tonight, Eamon will talk about Dublin Port and its links to the city. And then next week, uh, my colleague Jim Keller will talk about the diving bell, the object that became uh, a museum. Uh, Eamon O'Reilly uh, was appointed as chief executive of the company uh, in 2010. Previously, he was chief executive at Fort Row Stevedores. Um, and he's a chartered engineer, uh, qualifying from UCD, but also holds an MBA from Trinity College. Um, he is a, a member of Engineers Ireland, uh, the General Stevedoring Council, and until recently was the chair of uh, the European Seaports uh, Organization. So we're going to have a, a fascinating talk uh, tonight uh, on Dublin Port and its links to the city. As with last week, we will have uh, questions. Um, please do ask your questions to the chat function, which you'll find uh, at the bottom of, of your screen. And, and without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Eamon uh, to start his talk on Dublin Port and its links to the city. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Lar. Um, I'm just going to start off. Most of what I'll be doing tonight is talking to a series of, of images. So uh, let me just one moment, just get the screen sharing working. My apologies for flaking. Um, good evening and, and welcome to the, this talk. Um, the talk is, is obviously part of this short series a series to, to uh, record a momentous, small momentous moment in engineering in Dublin Port 150 years ago, when the first of and Bloodstoney's blocks were laid as part of the construction of the North Wall Key Extension. Um, the significance of, of it being the, the 150th anniversary of that happening, it is halfway through what I consider to be the 333 year long development of Dublin Port to its ultimate size and shape, uh, by which will be achieved by 2040. And I'll return to, to this um, a little bit later. Um, sorry, Laura mentioned that this is the, the second of the three. Ron last week gave a, a wonderful lecture on the 36 year career of Bindon Bloodstoney between the years of 1862 and 1898 as the port engineer. And the most iconic thing that I think emerging from, from um, Bin of Bloodstone's career was the diving bell and Jim Keller, as Lars said, will, will give a talk on the creation of what I refer to as the, the littlest museum in Dublin. Um, Ron and Jim had very specific focuses in, in their talks. I've been given a much broader brief uh, to talk about the links between the port and the city, and there, there's many dimensions to those links. Um, a lot of the material that I'll talk about tonight uh, is, is available elsewhere online at, uh, in, on a website called the Dublin Port Post-2040 Dialogue. Some of the images are available also on our own main website through the archive. Um, but if you have any queries arising from the material that I'm presenting tonight, if you just send an email into info.dublinport.ie, there's a lot of, of things we can share with you, and we'd be delighted to do that. But as I think about the links between the port and the city, I think there's, there's five aspects I'd like to discuss. Um, firstly, is the, uh, are the economic links. I won't, I'll be very brief on those, and then talk about the links between the port and the city through history. Talk a little bit about the decisive and unavoidable influence of, of geography and what's happened in Dublin. I then want to talk about the salutary lesson, as I would see it, of, of what happens when you take a nebulous concept like the link between the port and the city for granted and how you can get things wrong. And then to finish up the talk, look at what we in Dublin Port Company are doing today to re-establish the links between the port and the city as we work to bring this 333 year uh, long project to develop Dublin Port to its ultimate conclusion in just 20 years time. 
So if, if I start out on the economics, so I assure you this is the only slide where I'm putting up statistics, but I think it's important just to talk a little bit about uh, the, the uh, scale of Dublin Port. If we look at all of the ships arriving into, uh, cargo ships arriving into ports around the island of Ireland in 2019, 60% of them came here into Dublin Port. Uh, and in, on average, the ships coming into Dublin Port are bigger than the ships going elsewhere. So 70% of the gross tonnage of all ships came into Dublin Port. The, mo the most obvious thing we all see related to port throughput are containers and trailers on the road. And again, in 2019, 84% of all of those that came through ports in Ireland came through Dublin Port. Uh, and finally, I think, and I always find this a, just a fascinating notion that Dublin is a huge energy port. If you look at all of the energy consumed in the country in 2019, but 38% of all of the energy consumed in Ireland came through two small oil jetties here in Dublin Port. Um, I'd like to say that all of this great success and market share is down to uh, our own great commercial and business acumen, but, but truth is it's not. The scale and importance of Dublin Port are, are very much functions of the geography, which gives the physical link between the port and the city. And as we look at the challenges we're facing for the future, they actually are pretty much identical to those of Bindon Blood Stoney 150 years ago, and indeed to those of his predecessors starting from about 1707, which is when, for me, the story of Dublin Port commences. So if I go back to just before 1707, this is, a, I think it's an endlessly fascinating map from 1704, showing Dublin, uh, Dublin Port and the Liffey Channel. And just to orient you, this is Essex Bridge or Grattan Bridge, as we now know. So this is the area of Cable Street. So the port was coming down a distance here and it's wonderfully measured in, in purchase. If I, if I remember correctly, a perch is 15 and a half feet. But this, this distance here would take you down to about Butt Bridge. So from Butt Bridge, the bay was entirely open. There was a narrow spit here, which was Ring's End. And Dublin Port, or ships coming and trying to get up the Liffey, up as far as, as Essex Bridge, were having to come through a very difficult channel and had to come over this very, very awkward bar which was a real constraint on the, oh, my apologies, a real constraint on the development of the port. Um, there was a lot of consternation among the business class in Dublin. They felt something had to be done to improve the situation. Uh, and what was done was the creation of the first port authority in Dublin in 1707. And the development of the port is, it's beautifully illustrated in a series of five, um, five drawings that are in our archive. Um, and these five drawings were displayed, we, we think, back in 1931 as part of the bicentenary of the RDS. And, and in the first of the five drawings, it looks at the period 1707 to 1786, and that's the exact period of this first port authority, which was the uh, Ballast Office Committee of Dublin Corporation. So Dublin Corporation was running the port through a committee, and its big challenge and its great success over that period was the building of the, the Great South Wall. Also during the period of that first port authority, the North Lots and the South Lots were created by infill. Uh, and the edge here on the North Lots is exactly East Wall Road as we know it today. So by the end of the 18th century, the Great South Wall had been built as, as a means to stop the migration of sand into the channel and it was successful in that, but it only half solved the problem. And in the second of the, the five drawings, uh, we can see the building of the North Bull Wall, and we can see the beginning of the, the building out of Dublin Port by infill into the bay eastwards from, from the North Lots. Um, and all of the works that are, that are shown here are the works that were completed by the second Port Authority, which had a rather grandiose title, the Corporation for Preserving and Improving uh, the Port of Dublin, and it was, was known as the, the Ballast Board. In the third drawing that we have, um, it's for the period 1867 to 1898, and it's more or less the period 
that Bindon Blood Stony was at work in the port. And we can see the building of North Wall Key Extension. So it's 150 years ago, the first blocks were laid here at this point to build that out. And carrying on very quickly through the final two drawings in this series of five, um, we can see, I apologize, we can see um, roughly what was happening in the port around the turn of the century, um, where there's more work going on and an eastern breakwater being built. And as we go on then to um, the early years, um, just before the founding of the state, we can see the shape of Dublin Port beginning to be pretty much like we know it today. The, the big thing that had yet to come was the, was the building of the, the ferry terminals and that unitized area where the Irish ferries and Stena Line ships are coming in and out of. There, there's a sixth drawing um, that we have in our, well, sorry, my fingers are too sensitive. Um, and th this is a later map. Um, which shows the, the post-war period up to about 1955. And I, I think it's a useful indicator of a constant frame of mind among the people responsible for the port and the way it was to be developed. All the time in the previous drawings in this, you can see the port moving ever eastwards down the river, all the time looking to access deeper water. Um, and the success, the success of that approach was self-evident. So this was a period when people understood that the port needed to develop and they accepted what was happening. I'm not aware of there being any significant controversies about what, were hap what was happening. But I think the observation or the realization that I've come to as, a, as I look at these drawings is that organizations like people, um, they can become set in their ideas. Uh, and so it was in Dublin port. And this led to the link between the port and the city being damaged. Uh, and that's what, that's what we have been working to address over the last decade. I'll return to that in, in, a, in a little while, but just to understand the shape and size of Dublin Port and why it developed in the way it did, I think it's, it's useful to, to have a look at ports elsewhere. Um, if we go first up to, to the Baltic and we look at the port of Copenhagen, in Copenhagen, the city is right beside the water, and this is quite deep water. It's the Arlesund, um, uh, with with Malmo in Sweden close by. But the port was built. You can see it was built by man, old sharp edges, all built by by infill. Elsewhere in in the Baltic, if we go up to Helsinki, we can see something very similar happening, where the city is built right beside the water. Port facilities were easily built with access to deep water. And in the case of Helsinki, you can see a vacated area here where a large amount of, of port activities are moved about 25 kilometers up the coast to a place called Viosari. And Viosari was a new port developed on the, on the site of um, a derelict uh, shipyard. What we see in the Baltic, you see something similar, but in some ways a little bit different down in the Mediterranean. And if we look at Genoa and Barcelona, again, you can see cities right beside the water, ready access to deep water. And, and the common characteristic down the Mediterranean is the building of these long breakwaters to provide sheltered areas within the harbors that were then constructed. Um, and coming closer to home, we're now into the realm of, of river ports. And obviously the great river port in Europe is, is Rotterdam. Uh, and Rotterdam, as happened with Dublin, so progressively moved down right to the sea. And within the last decade and a half, this huge extension that looks like Darth Vader's helmet to me, that's about 2000 hectares in extent, about four times the total land and water area of Dublin port. So progressively building closer and closer to the sea and ultimately infilling into the sea. And I think that's probably as far as, as Rotterdam will ever go, but you'd never put it past the Dutch not to do something, something very, very innovative. And if I go down to, to Bilbao, Bilbao would be about the same size as Dublin in cargo handling terms. The port originally right down the river, a small river called the Nervium. And the Guggenheim Museum, somewhere in that area, 
but progressively the port has moved down river, a breakwater was built, and now the new modern port is, is in the, the Bay of Bis the Bay of Bilbao, which leads straight into the Bay of Biscay and its deep waters. So all of the ports developed in different ways. All of them developed in ways that were defined by the geography. And so it was in Dublin, where you can see, I, this is an image I, I love. As you look eastwards across the city, you can barely even make out that there is a port here. The port is sheltered within the, the great harbour walls in Dublin, which in turn is sheltered by, by Dublin Bay. Looking the other direction, you, you get a sense of very, very busy and a very active port, cheek and jowl with the city. But as you would have seen from the images up in the Baltic, down in the, the Mediterranean and in uh, Rotterdam and Bilbao, in every case, the ports and the cities are cheek by jowl. And that is very much a, a very common feature all, all across Europe for reasons, very sensible reasons of, of, of history. The third image of Dublin Port, which I love, is looking over the Pool Bay Peninsula. And the Pool Bay Peninsula, I finished talking later on, uh, on the Pool Bay Peninsula, but that's the last area we see Dublin Port being, being developed. Um, and I think Dublin Port and the links, I, I think they've become very weakened because the port is not all that visible. It's, it, it is along the banks of the Liffey. And um, in some ways, I think you'd really need to, like a, like a, a rubber glove, put your hand in and pull Dublin Port out to get a sense of its scale. And, and we've done something which might help to visualize the scale of Dublin Port within the Dublin Port post-2040 dialogue. We designed alternative ports. Um, we looked at the idea that some people have moved it, which we don't agree with that Dublin Port should be moved. So we actually designed ports. Uh, first one is up in Braymore near Balbriggan, and the second one is down in Arklow. And this is what Dublin Port would look like if you turned it inside out and pulled it out into the sea. The, the defining feature of Dublin Port, it, it is a river port. And in the words of, of one of the papers within that, um, that, that Dublin Port post-2040 dialogue, we, we've put in the words, because Dublin Port is nestled into Dublin Bay and along the banks of the Liffey, it can be difficult to appreciate its size. For example, the distance from the Tom Clark Bridge to the end of the easternmost berth in Dublin Port, it's almost three kilometers. And it's another two kilometers from that point to the Pool Bed Lighthouse. So five kilometers from the Tom Clark Bridge to the Pool Bed Lighthouse. And if you were to build these alternative ports or replacement ports, the one up in Braymore would extend 3.4 kilometers out into the Irish Sea. And the one at Arklow would be, um, so my apologies, 3.4 kilometers to the RSC at Arklow. The, the deep water is relatively accessible there, but it would be a full 4.5 kilometers uh, if built at, at Braymore. So Dublin is, is a river port, and, and understanding exactly why it is where it is, I, I think, again, going elsewhere, and this is the example that I would frequently use. This is the Congo River. And you see in this image, the Congo plume. That's an enormous jet of water coming from this mighty river, thrusting far out into the Atlantic, further in distance than the distance from Dublin to Holyhead. And the effect of this stream of water is to scour out an enormously deep entrance to the port where you, you have depths of some places 200 meters and some places 300 meters. Now, the flow of water here is it's 41,000 tons per second. The equivalent figure in the biggest river in Ireland in the Shannon is 208. And the figure in Dublin is, is a mere 14. The River Liffey is really a puny river. And that is the reason why there is a bar in Dublin. There is no big tidal scour to push through that bar. So the, the great innovation in the development of Dublin was after the Great South Wall was, be, was built was the construction of the North Bull Wall. And what was achieved, it's, it's um, very, very brilliantly, I think, recorded uh, in retrospect in, in a lovely book, which, which we have a copy of in the port, 
from 1881 by a port engineer called uh, Isaac John Mann. And he recorded the progressive deepening of the bar once the North Bull Wall was built. They started the North Bull Wall in 1819, they finished in 1824, and over the 54 years to 1873, there were a number of surveys taken. And, and the conclusion from all of this, this data beautifully presented by man, is that the average rate of increase in the depth at the entrance to the port was two inches per annum over a period of 54 years. So by 1873, the depth on the bar coming into Dublin port was about 4.9 meters. And today we're bringing the port to its final and its ultimate depth of, of about 10 meters. Uh, we have two thirds of the work completed already to do that. So what I've talked about so far, it is all about the history of the development of the port, how that was framed by geography and very much as you look back, you can see that the realities of Dublin Port and what happened were very much in the consciousness of people in the city. Uh, and the best example of that probably comes from, from uh, James Joyce's uh, Dubliners, written in 1914. And in two of those stories, uh, first one, an encounter, the story of, of kids um, bunking from school and heading off on an adventure from the north side to the south side. They have to get across the river uh, and they described, or Joyce describes it in lovely words. He says, it was noon when we reached the quays and as all the laborers seemed to be eating their lunches, we bought two big currant buns and sat down to eat them on some metal piping beside the river. We pleased ourselves with the spectacle of Dublin's commerce. Now, I'm not sure you'd hear too many people today say we pleased ourselves with the spectacle of Dublin's commerce, but it was entirely natural for Joyce to, to put this story and the theme of that he was dealing with and to, to put the action down in, in, the, in the port. Likewise, in, in the wonderful story, Evelyn, um, uh, she has a heartbreaking moment or the changing moment in her life, uh, right down at, at North Wall Quay, where the ferry would have been coming in, and she's getting ready to board the ferry, will she or will she not? And, and Joyce writes, the boat blew a long morning for whistle into the mist. If she went tomorrow, she would be on the sea with Frank steaming towards Buenos Aires. Their passage had been booked. Could she still draw back after all he had done for her? So it was entirely natural in 1914, Joyce, and you'll find her all through Ulysses as well, and indeed in a portrait of the artist, lots of the action in and around the port. Also in 1914, um, the Dublin Civics Institute organized a competition uh, to asking people to give their ideas on a plan for Dublin. And the winners were announced in 1916. I'm not sure whether it was before or after the rising, but uh, among the winners was, was a gentleman called Patrick Abercrombie, a well-known uh, name in, 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 in the history of planning. And he would have been responsible subsequently for the creation of the County of London plan for the post-war reconstruction of, of London. So it was very, very natural for the port engineers and periods past I've described, and indeed for Abercrombie in 1916, to look at the development of the port in relation to what the city's requirements were. And what Abercrombie proposed was an enormous infill of the bay of, of about 1,250 hectares. Um, so this is where Sandyman Strand is, entirely filled in. This is the north start of the North Bull Wall, so entirely filling in the Talc Estrium, surely pr provided for the flow of the river. Um, but of that 1,250 hectares, 825 hectares were destined for port and port industry uses, and 400 hectares for housing. And again, this is a lovely image that if you get your hands on, get it on the screen, you can look at some of the detail. For example, up here in St. Anne's Park, he has designed the layout of the park in the shape of, looks to me to be a, a, a regal crown. Down here on the south side, he has identified an area for development he refers to as a, as a power citadel, uh, which is very much what we've ended up with today with the, 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 the chimneys of the, of, um, the Poolbeg power station. 
And um, so that was what was happening in 1916. Um, very much the same type of thinking that we'd seen over centuries. And the firmness of those ideas, and this is where, in my mind, Dublin Port started to run itself into trouble. In, in 1965, the Dublin Port and Docks Board proposed an enormous infill into Dublin Bay as the ultimate solution to port's capacity problems. Um, seven years later, in 1972, they published a, a document and drawings called Studies and Long-Term Development of the Port of Dublin. And the Im image I've shown here is what they proposed on the north side of, of the Liffey. And again, just to orient, orientate you, this is North Bull Lighthouse. Here is the River Talca confined to a narrow um, exit. And this is this enormous infill. So this is 1972. It's pretty much identical to what Abercrombie had suggested in 1916. On the south side, um, I always think this is extraordinary, Poolbeg Lighthouse, Black Rock Baths. This is the line that Abercrombie envisaged that the port or that the city would have onto the bay and this enormous area of infill in Sandy Mount Strand. And again, in, in um, 1972, the Port and Docks Board, they were basically copying what Abercrombie had said in 1916, and they identified the need for 800 hectares of infill for port land and 400 for infill for housing. Now, the board at the time, they were quite conscious that we were getting into a lot of controversy. The world was changing. And I don't think they were ready for that change. So these studies were supported by experts, planning experts in port and city development from the port of Rotterdam. They had a former chief traffic advisor from the British Ministry of Transport, an ESRI economist and an Irish landscape architect. And really the port at that stage was very defensive. It knew what it wanted to do. However, it knew that it was now being opposed by by many people in the city. And, and the link in the port was getting very weak at, at this stage. The, the, the problem of, of the isolation or the increasing isolation of the port, it, it carried on and between 1979 and 2010, over a period of 31 years, the port attempted to infill um, 21 hectares opposite Clontarf. Um, it, it very much was, was a case of the port for those years, thinking the same way that people had thought for two centuries before, but not realizing that the world was changing around them. So the challenge we've had uh, starting about 10 years ago, we needed a new approach and we needed to rebuild that link between the port and the city. With the port being geographically isolated from where people lived, we, we looked around for ways in which we could make that link. And, and I guess we, we thought that things like um, Joyce understood the port, it was in his consciousness. So we started out in 2016 and we used, we used the arts. Uh, in this case, uh, we commissioned with the, with the National Concert Hall, a um, basically a song cycle. Uh, curated by Paul Noonan of Bell X1, various people within the lineup of the concerts for, for this song cycle. John Sheehan, um, Colin McEnumera is there, Declan O'Rourke, Lisa O'Neill, uh, Gemma Hayes. If you're not familiar with the music on it, well worth tracking it down. It, it is available on Spotify. Um, but as part of that, that, that song cycle for the two concerts, um, there was also commissioned a, a 30 minute uh, piece by the um, novelist Katrina Lally. She's got a wonderful novel, if you're not familiar with it, called Eggshells, I'd highly recommend it. But, but these are, are some of the words that, that Katrina, Katrina wrote. Uh, she said, I feel a sense of connectedness with the rest of the, my apologies, with the rest of the world, an awareness of invisible lines stretching across the sea linking this small island to larger islands and land masses the world over. Those invisible lines tentacle across history with ghosts of Guinness barges past, Joyce's bulging porterhouse barges plying the Liffey between the storehouse and the port. The city skirting canals are silent now, but if you squint your eyes and pause your mind, 
You can picture the canal barges bringing goods from the port up the Royal and the Grand. Let your mind meander and glut yourself on the sea tales and river stories written into port waters. Hear mention of the characters who shaped the port. Bindon Bloodstone with this cartoon bad guy name. Captain Bly who survived the mutiny on the bounty. Think of the hustle and bustle, the clamour and commotion of the quays when the port came right up to the Liffey. Follow the port's move eastwards to the Liffey mouth with its sandbanks and sandbars, mud banks and mud flats, shallows and slob lands. Picture the dredging and silting, the sluicing and scouring that went into making the port what it is today. And then when all imagining is done, creep into a quiet corner of a large ship, make like a stowaway and take to the seas. The, the success of that project um, for us was, was absolutely seminal in, in getting a sense of confidence about what we were about, about trying to remake this link with the port and the city, having used music and, and, um, and, and uh, spoken word. We had subsequent initiatives with um, the visual arts and with theatre. Uh, and all the time we were meeting fantastically positive responses. Once we pointed out to people what the port was about or to creative people, they really enjoyed getting involved, enjoyed portraying the port, it was something new to them, but their response was very similar to the responses that came naturally to Joyce and to others a, a century, a century or so before. And, and as we, we got into working on this link between the port and the city, we, we knew very much that we needed not only this, this um, reactivation of the consciousness, we also needed to create physical links. Um, and we're in the middle or the early stages of a tremendous series of projects to create what we refer to as a distributed museum. And I just described some of the elements and the stages as to where we are on them. That the starting point of our distributed museum, and it's a that the whole thing will be a, a an over six kilometer uh, walk or cycle, starting at the diving bell, uh, which Jim will talk about tomorrow coming down on North Wall Quay, down to a, a wonderful project. We refer to the Liffey Talca project. That's a 1.4 kilometer stretch of new public realm on which you'll be able to cycle and walk. So some of the port lands are being redesigned by Grafton Architects. We'll submit the scheme for planning, hopefully within the next month or so. And I'm hoping by the end of next year, you will have this link from the Liffey to the Talca. It provides a, a, a potential onward link to um, the Sutton, the Sandy Cove. But more importantly, it will link into this greenway. And some of the works on this have already commenced. This first 1.9 kilometer stretch, I'm hoping we'll have that finished by the end of next year. The, la the, the second phase will take a couple of more years. Also, there will be a spur down Alexandra Road uh, to um, the pump house. And that is a heritage area that Lar, who introduced the talk tonight, is currently working on. And that will be completed within a couple of months. And for three months, um, a new productions will, will stage uh, a new piece of theater um, inspired by what, what's referred to as the, 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 um, the name book, which is a book from within our archives. And that will be well worth keeping an eye out for. We, we have already within the pump house We've already had music. Um, there's a lovely piece, again, this is available on Spotify from the, the very talented pianist Morla Carroll called Ryark and Coon. Uh, and that was recorded in the Pump House. It's available on Spotify. It's also available on YouTube. Last November, we ran a series of plays in the Pump House, which were, were live streamed, five plays in total during the, obviously, during the, the, the period when COVID presented any of us going to, to theatres. We also have a very ambitious master plan for the old Odlum's flour mill, again produced by Grafton Architects, and that is part of the series of projects that together, and this, all of this might take 5, 10, 15 years to bring every element of it into being. This is going to be a wonderful, I, I think it's going to be a unique um, physical integration in a very modern sense of an ancient port with the city 
with which it lost its, its, its connections. I'm going to finish up then by just talking a little bit about the final stage of the development of Dublin Port, and that's going to be on the Pool Bay Peninsula. So we have a project where we're about to start discussions with the Royal Planola. And in about two years' time, we aim to, to lodge a planning application for this project. We, we have a habit of putting terrible names on our projects. This is called the, the 3FM project. It's the third and final master plan project. Uh, it will involve the building of a new bridge across the Liffey, the development of, of new um, container terminal in front of the ESB power station. Immensely complex and difficult with huge planning challenges. But it is a, a project, the design of which is very much informed, I think, by a new understanding we have developed about how to integrate the port with the, the city. So just to conclude, our aim is that by, by 2040, that we will have completed the job that started 333 years ago in 1707 to develop Dublin Port in a manner where the link between the port and the city is as robust and valued as it ever was. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eamon, that was a fascinating talk and thank you very, very much for that. Um, just looking at some of the questions that come in, an, an interesting one from Owen. How do ports of Northern Ireland look, uh, change the statistics that you showed in, in your first slide in relation to, to uh, Southern Ireland? Um, I, 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 I guess that's, that's a Brexit question. Um, what, what we're seeing at the moment is, is um, if, if you think about the ports of Northern Ireland, the main ones, Belfast and Larn, and take them together, they're servicing a population of 1.8 million people. Dublin Port also serves a population of 1.8 million people in the greater Dublin area. And there's no real competition between ports because of, because of geography. But what you can have is, is a movement of port or volume north and south, depending on things like customs borders. So at the moment, I think we are seeing a, a, an increase or have seen an increase in volume going through Northern Ireland, mainly through Belfast, at Dublin Port's expense. But month by month, we're, we're seeing all of this settle down and very much we're now starting to see the volumes in Dublin returning to what they were. I, I think when you, when you look at a 333 year development project of Dublin Port, what's happening in and around Brexit and what's happening in ports north of the border or indeed in Ross Lair, it is very much a blip over a long, I think it's an inexorable trend upwards of volume through Dublin Port. And again, as, as I said earlier, it's, it's not down to our commercial brilliance, it is down to realities of geography. Uh, and that is what is, is driving that. Um, thank you very much, Emma. that's fascinating. Another question that's just come in. Um, how about an eventual cruise uh, ship terminal uh, in the port? We, 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 when we first um, published our master plan in 2012, very much the development of um, cruise berths, and again on North Wall Key Extension, that very much was part of, of, of the plan. What we always said in our master plan was that it's an enormously expensive project. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had got to the point of designing what those new cruise berths would be. The total cost was going to be something in the order of 180 million euros. And we, we, that's an enormous undertaking, far beyond our means. So we, we ran a public consultation in 20, late 2019, looking to see the level of interest and commitment that people would make, number one, to put finance in alongside ourselves into, into such a development. And number two, to guarantee throughput, because that's an enormous risky project to do. Uh, and the response was not sufficient to justify us proceeding with that project. Um, so the, we decided in around April, May last year, having looked at all of the responses and thought through the commercial realities, it simply wasn't viable or feasible for us to, to build dedicated cruise berths. Um, quite what the future for cruise holds, I, I just don't know. It's enormously challenging because the berths in Dublin with the cruise ships used to come a couple of years back before, before COVID are now unbelievably busy with cargo trade from continental Europe because of Brexit. Um, at the moment, cruise ships are banned from coming into Dublin by the government. And so what the future holds, I, I really don't know, but it's, 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 it's hugely challenging for that sector, not only in Dublin, but, but everywhere I suspect. Thank you, uh, Eamon. 
A question from Tim Odlum. Uh, in Joyce's time, everyone could see how cargo was handled and the processes involved. Um, how can you include that in your master plan? Um, the, the, way, the way that we hope to include, the way we are doing that within our master plan, that Dublin Port Distributed Museum is going to bring people right down into the heart of the port, close to the action. And it, it is almost a counterintuitive way to, to develop a port. But we, we came to the conclusion, about, as I said earlier, about 10 years ago, that unless the people of the city understand the port, then you really are on an uphill struggle to try to develop the port in the way that you need to. I, I think the most exciting thing that we have within that distributed museum that I described earlier, uh, we now own the, the Adams Flower Mill. We have a mass plan for its development. At the top of the Adams Flower Mill, there are magnificent views. A handful of us here in Dublin Port have been able to go there and, and look out. We, we aim with the redevelopment and repurposing of that whole Adams Flower Mill area to put our vessel traffic service, so the, the, the guys like air traffic control who control the movement of ships, we aim to put them on the top of the Adams silos, the ones that you see when you look across the river from the um, from the, the, the toll booths for the East Link Bridge. But in addition to having that operation aspect, we're also planning to open that to the public. So that whole Adlams area will become a center for the port's archive. Uh, we have plans to put theater facilities in there, plans to put, uh, I don't wanna say a museum, it's not going to be a museum, it's going to be an archive in the modern sense of what archives are. And that is, fantastic places to, to, to display and interpret the heritage of, of the port and the city, but with the added bonus of having magnificent vistas all across the port, all across the bay, and all up the Liffey across the city. If you've been in, in the, um, the Guinness Hop Store in the, um, the high bar, the gravity, gravity bar, bar, in the gravity bar, the views are even better than from the gravity bar. And that, that is in our plans to complete that. Um, thank you for that. Interesting question from Joe Mooney. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, due to lack of suitable accommodation locally, a number of port-related businesses built houses for their employees. Did the Port and Docks Board ever consider initiating a house-building scheme uh, to facilitate their, their staff? I don't think they did. I, I don't think so. I suppose that the, mo the most obvious examples of, if you like, corporately built housing would be the, BRB, the Coast Guard cottages down on, on the south side of the port, built very much... A, and, yeah, and you'll see similar developments all around. You see them down in Cork, you'll, you'll see them all around the place. Um, what I always find fascinating is, is all around East Wall. There's developments there with, with um, very peculiar names, not immediately recognized them as Irish names, but these were, were developments that were built to, to house the workers of industries. So I think, yes, it did happen for, for um, many industries. Guinness has obviously did it elsewhere in Dublin. Um, but no, I'm not aware of Dublin Port ever having in any of its, its, its uh, the many generations of, of Port Authorities ever having got involved in, in housing workers. Okay, but I'm going to go for, for one last question um, uh, from Mia. Are there any plans for Graving Dock 1? Graving Dock 1, is, if, if I go back to the original ideas I mentioned about the port losing its connection with the city, um, on, on, and there was, there was real commercial pressures on the port in the, in the early 2000s to provide more and more capacity for cargo. And a decision was taken at that time to infill Graving Dock 1. Um, that left the ninth, and that was the one that built by Bind and Bloodstone, sorry, built by, by uh, Dargan, the railway engineer, during Stoney's time. Um, and, and that was infilled. Fortunately, we know exactly where it is, how it was infilled, and it is part of, of our plans. Indeed, it's, it's virtually a planning condition for works we have ongoing at the moment, that we will re-excavate that, and we will integrate that graving dock with the heritage zone that is now being completed that I described earlier. So the, the distributed museum is going to include a stepped granite graving dock, quite similar in look to what you see up in, up in Belfast Harbour, and it is going to be an absolutely magnificent spectacle right beside the, the original pump house, which is where I mentioned we have done theatre and, and music recently. 
Thank you much, Eamon, for that. And um, thanks, everyone, for, for listening in. Um, I think we'll finish up there um, and do encourage you to come back next week for Jim Keller's lecture at the same time at 6.30 next Thursday. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, and uh, good night and enjoy the sun while it lasts.